Welcome to another Read Aloud book tour. Today we'll be reading A Child Called It by David Peltzer, New York Times and USA Today bestseller. Chapter 1, The Rescue. March 5th, 1973, Daly City, California. I'm late. I've got to finish the dishes on time, otherwise no breakfast. And since I didn't have dinner last night, I have to make sure I get something to eat. Mother's running around yelling at my brothers. I can hear her stomping down the hallway towards the kitchen. I dip my hands back into the scalding rinse water. It's too late. She catches me with my hands out of the water. Smack! Mother hits me in the face and I topple to the floor. I know better than to stand there and take the hit. I learned the hard way that she takes that as an act of defiance, which means more hits, or worst of all, no food. I regain my posture and dodge her looks as she screams into my ears. I act timid, nodding to her threats. Please, I say to myself, just let me eat. Hit me again, but I have to have food. Another blow pushes my head against the tile countertop. I let the tears of mock defeat stream down my face as she storms out of the kitchen, seemingly satisfied with herself. After I count her steps, making sure she's gone, I breathe a sigh of relief. The act worked. Mother can beat me all she wants, but I haven't let her take away my will to somehow survive. Initial observations on the first page and a half of the book. The way it's written catches my attention. The first chapter is written all in italics, which usually indicates a flashback or a memory or someone's thoughts to themselves. So this is a young man here who's telling a story about how his mother was abusing him, him and not his two brothers, which is interesting. And he uses quite a bit of imagery to help put us in the time and place that he was experiencing this. He says his hands were supposed to be in scalding rinse water. That's going to be so hot it hurts the hands. Then smack is all in, it in a italicized but all caps. So it catches your attention. He's hungry. He, wa he just wants food. Right? We've all had that feeling in our stomachs, but he's practically starving. So we've got these visceral images that are supposed to rope us in. And I think it's doing a great job so far of making me feel terrible for the young man and hoping things get better for him. Chapter 2. Good Times. In the years before I was abused, my family was the Brady Bunch of the 1960s. My two brothers and I were blessed with the perfect parents. Our every whim was fulfilled with love and care. We lived in a modest two-bedroom house in what was considered a good neighborhood in Daly City. I can remember looking out of our living room bay window on a clear day to gaze at the bright orange towers of the Golden Gate Bridge and the beautiful skyline of San Francisco. My father, Stephen Joseph, supported his family as a fireman working in the heart of San Francisco. He stood about 5 feet 10 inches tall and weighed about 190 pounds. He had broad shoulders and forearms that would make any muscle man proud. His thick black eyebrows matched his hair. I felt special when he winked at me and called me Tiger. My mother, Catherine Roerva, was a woman of average size and appearance. I never could remember the color of her hair or eyes, but mom was a woman who glowed with love for her children. Her greatest asset was her determination. Mom always had ideas and she always took command of all family matters. Once when I was four or five years old, mom said she was sick and I remember feeling that she did not seem to be herself at all. It was a day when father was working at the fire station. After serving dinner, mom rushed from the table and began painting the steps that led to the garage. She coughed as she frantically brushed the red paint onto every step. The paint had not fully dried when mom began tacking rubber mats to the steps. The red paint was all over the mats and mom. When she finished, mom went into the house and collapsed on the couch. I remember asking her why she had put the mats down before the paint dried. She smiled and said, I just wanted to surprise your dad. Initial observations of chapter two, good times. 
Normally, I wouldn't skip the rest of chapter one, but since it was written in italics and as a flashback, I was curious to see how the rest of the book would progress. In chapter two, it looks completely different than the first chapter, and even the tone is completely different. He says, in the years before I was abused, life was great. We were the Brady Bunches of the 1960s. Our house was nice looking. My dad was a firefighter in San Francisco, and he was a pretty good looking guy, pretty buff. Mom was pretty average looking, and he says the only thing that stands out to him was her determination. Normally, that would be a positive thing, but as he tells a particular memory of his mom when he was younger, you'll notice that determination was slightly twisted for mom. She wanted to surprise dad by painting some curbs red and putting some mats down, but she didn't wait for it to dry, and so the paint got on the mats and on mom. And when asked about it, she says, oh, I just wanted to surprise your dad. Which is strange because normally you would plan it better and you would be determined to achieve your goal in a normal fashion. And she kind of takes on this manic feeling. So I think the author is doing a very interesting thing here of slowly teasing out some of the details of how life was good. And then it slowly went off the deep end here into a very traumatic time for him. And it looks as though he's going to mix back and forth between um, the severe trauma and then the things leading up to it. This is not one of those stories that you're going to love reading, but you will feel the justice for the child needs to be held. And um, hopefully you'll find some inspiration as he does call it an inspirational story about his own life.